Hello everyone, welcome to BeagleCast episode 4. Today we have Tomas from Bootlin talking about their new embedded Linux course. We also have Jason and Robert here, and we might have a few folks jump in later. Hello. Hello. Thomas, I'm so excited about this training. I cannot contain myself. I'm just super excited to see that you guys are continuing to participate in the, the, the BeagleBoard world. Um, and I just love your, your training um, materials and, and everything that you do for the open source community. So super excited to have you on today. Yeah, we're also really excited about it for sure. Uh, for us, uh, sharing uh, training materials uh, has been our policy for a long time. And uh, recently, we've been looking at uh, updating our course um, to support some more modern hardware platforms. So we looked at what's available, and it kind of felt like obvious that the Beagle Play was the, the right platform to choose. We've, we have already been using the Beagle Bone for many, many years. We have trained, I don't know, hundreds of engineers, probably thousands of engineers using the Beagle Bone. So it looked like yeah, normal thing to just continue with the with the bigger play and have a, a more modern ARM sixty four based platform to uh, to teach embed the Linux uh, on. Cool. I, I feel like we should talk some about openness, right? So it, it, you're you're making money essentially off of giving courses to people to teach embedded Linux engineers, you know, professional developers how to create embedded Linux systems, right? The right way, right? To get it, to get it, to understand how, how everything works, to get it all done the right way. You make money at that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe I should share a little bit of background on, on what we do at Bootlane. We're an embedded Linux consulting company. So we do engineering projects and we do trainings. A lot of people know us for the trainings that we do because the materials are free. But this is only about like a quarter of our business. Like the, the majority, actually, three quarters of our business is actually doing actual engineering projects. And, I, and I'll get back to, to that because it actually matters for the trainings that we give. So about like a quarter of the business we do indeed this is uh, teaching training courses to engineers across the world. We've done that since 2004, so it's going to be almost 20 years now. And since day one, we had chosen a policy that back then was quite original, and I think still today is quite original, which is to share freely all the training materials that we create, right? So they are shared under a Creative Commons license, which means anyone can access the source code, modify it, redistribute the changes, make custom trainings based on that. And we know even that some of our competitors are using those materials, and it's fine. I mean, we anyway don't have the resources to teach all the people in the world who need to learn about embedded Linux, so we need others to do to do that as well. So we're happy to share the materials. Um, so we've done that um, for the past close to 20 years, um, initially with one course, and then we know of, uh, I think, eight or nine training courses now. We just uh, released uh, last week the materials for another more specialized course, and same, materials are free open source. Um, for us, it's kind of a, a double thing. On, on one side, it's it's committing to this knowledge sharing kind of value that we have because we are people from the open source community. So we really believe in, in, in knowledge sharing and we think the more people know stuff, the better the world's going to be. Ultimately, it's kind of the, the, big, the big idea. But then there's also a more uh, businessy thing be, behind it, right? Because those materials are open source. A lot of engineers around the world um, get to see them and not all of them, but a number of them are contacting us to actually purchase the course because when you purchase the course, you not only have the materials, but you have an experienced trainer in front of you that is teaching the course uh, and adding more value on top of the material. So sharing them open source is not just for the beauty of it. It is for one part, but the other aspect is that it's creating business. And that's how most of our customers get to know us. And the other aspect that we like a lot about our materials being open source is that anyone purchasing our course has the chance to check very carefully um, to what depth the course is going, right? So they know what it is going to be covering, and there is no surprise when they get the course. Um, while we have heard a lot of people taking a course with other companies and being disappointed because it was not like on spot or maybe not in depth enough or something like that, at least here everything is, is transparent, right? We have a GitHub repo with the LaTeX source code. Anyone can fork it, submit pull requests. So it's really an open source project. We receive external contributions, we accept them. Um, that's really an open source project. And so just to kind of look back with what I said initially about we don't do just training courses, the thing is that our trainers are not trainers, they are engineers. 
all year round. They do engineering projects, they port U-Boot, they port Linux, they write drivers, they do Yocto, they do build boots, they do graphics driver, network drivers, all sorts of embedded Linux things. And from time to time, we ask them to teach training courses. So what we kind of want to offer to the participants to our, to our training courses is this kind of like um, in-field, up-to-date experience from engineers who are doing real projects uh, all year round and not just teaching training courses one after the other. Awesome. Awesome. I just, I love the philosophy. Um, completely agree with it. I mean, I think that um, there's a lot of business opportunity that comes from, from sharing, being open, right? But let's, let's, there are certain things that are just, you know, it, it doesn't matter that much to share, right? It really doesn't hurt you. You really should share it. It increases the body of knowledge for, for everyone. It allows us all to kind of, kind of move up, but there's certain things that like there's expertise that you just can't, put into code or, or any sort of training materials or anything, right? They're, they're, it's about people ultimately, right? And like, what sort of things would somebody get out of like engaging in one of your courses and meeting some of your, your engineers, um, you know, in one of these trainings, right? That they couldn't get just out of the materials. Well, I think um, there's a number of things. Obviously, first, just reading slides by yourself is, is doable, but it's, it's kind of, hard to do without some some glue between them right to kind of make sense out of the whole the whole um, set of slides so it kind of adds that that glue around it which which is important by itself um, at least and I'm one of the trainers I teach this embedded Linux course among other courses at Woodlin and there's to tons of stuff that I add on top of the of, of the slides right when I teach training courses online I always have a terminal open and I just jump to the terminal show something that kind of complements the slides and adds more more details and that that thing is is almost never the same right depending on the question from the audience you kind of um, divert into some other conversation that's of course related to the topic but it kind of helps the the, the audience um, well, stay focused and, and put the course more in perspective with, with what they need. So all that extra value is, is different from one course to, to, to the other. And there's, of course, the question and answer that you get uh, when I do. Um, so when we do um, online training courses, we do the labs live in front of the, of the participants um, so that they can yeah, get the, the most out of it, even if they don't necessarily have the hardware to reproduce by themselves. And so participants are continuously asking questions. Oh, why are you doing this? Oh, that's a nice tip. And it's all that things they wouldn't get by just following the matters by themselves. So it's kind of, let's say, I think there's like three layers of value, right? You could just get the materials, you get them for free and you can follow them along. You can get an online training course, which is adding some value on top of the materials by having a trainer that explains uh, it to you and adds that glue and allows to answer the, the, the questions that you have. We also have a chat that's open in between the sessions and remains open after a training course. So there's kind of lots of conversation that can take place. And I think the, the even higher value is when you get the trainer on site at your location, because then there's all the extra uh, discussion during lunch, the breaks and, and sharing, you know, in a, Lots of different experiences about conferences, about uh, embedded Linux projects, technology uh, that you get that doesn't exist if you just read the materials that also don't exist that much if it's still online. So having the course on site brings even more value. So I kind of see three different levels of value uh, between getting just the material for free or getting a course online or getting a course on. So there's definitely yeah, a lot more than, than the materials when we when we teach a course. I would say I'm still like the PDF and it's been it's been great. Um, I have kind of the privileged position where I get to bother Nishan and Vignesh who wrote some of the U-Boot source code for that. So I get I get that kind of perspective. But I got you know definitely I think the in person I can see a lot of value there. Yep. Yeah, I would really yeah. appreciate the having having the in person in person myself. But I'll say that I, I'm about I think Andre's a little bit further on than I am. I think I'm about a third of the way through um, the labs right now. And um, all really good labs, all really kind of covering the right bases, it's, it, not just on their own, right? I mean, I, I think I have the benefit of having spent some time doing embedded Linux stuff already, but I can see how what you're teaching is, you know, ultimately the fundamentals that people need to be experienced yeah. with, right? Um, so yeah. I think I'm going to make it part of the requirements for all the GSOC students in the future is that they do I think that. you should. 
Yeah. What's, what's been really impressive to me is just how you guys find the the right level between, you know, making it simple to understand, but at the same time going to a certain level of depth so you can actually take it further. That's I think that's really hard to do in any kind of, you know, online lesson or tutorial. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I was going to say we have a, a kind of a particular philosophy in that course of not trying to deliver something that's too like pre-packaged, right? We don't mm -hmm. Tell the people, okay, please install I don't know Debian image, and everything is already there, and you don't really understand what's there. So we take like an approach that's a little bit like step by step, where we build the different blocks one by one. Of course, for each of them, we cannot dive into all of the details. Like when we build, uh, I don't know the bootloader, we have to say, okay, we have to configure U-boot, we configure it this way, and we build it. But we don't dive into the U-boot internals themselves because that would be another course on its own. But at least we expect that by the end of that course. It is clear for the participants, okay, when I do embed the Linux, I have a tool chain that provides a cross-compiler. I have a sequence of bootloaders that play different roles in the boot chain. Then I have a Linux kernel. Then I have boot file system, which is a space. They built all of that manually, and then they've used a build system to kind of automate all of yeah. that. So ideally, they have then a sense of what is inside an embedded Linux system, what is the overall architecture, even if they end up using Yocto or Debian or I don't know, something more elaborate, they at least have um, an understanding that it's not long, no longer a black box, but it's yeah. a set of components that they understand the role of each of them and how they kind of interact with each other. So it's kind yeah, of really, yeah. I really like the choice of putting cross tool ng in there, right? Because even though you could do it with Yocto or do it with Builder Root, right? That's an entire build system that kind of takes care of everything. Um, but you didn't go all the way to the level of like, you know, directly pulling the GCC sources and, and trying to, to do auto conf and auto make on all the, the, the all that stuff fully manually, right? You, you, you kind of chose a nice middle ground, but doing cross tool ng, so you, you kind of get empowered, you can dig into the layers without having so much to go through to try to understand how to build the various tool chains that you might want to use. I mean, when you do embed the Linux, you have to find a middle ground for certain topics. You have to stop diving at a certain level. I mean, if it works, it works, and you just accept that it works, right? If you try to dive into every single topic, you're never going to ship a product or a project, right? That's the, that's also the, the beauty of, of using Linux on embedded, right? We, uh, we, we sit on the shoulders of giants, right? They've done on, uh, an amazing amount of work. If we dive into the code of GCC or Binutils or all aspects of the kernel, you never get anything done, right? So we have to find in these, these middle ground solutions where, okay, we dive to a certain level that is necessary to understand what we need to do. But then what's below that, that level, okay, it's, we assume it works, it's been done correctly, and only if there's an issue or a particular problem to tackle, that, then we will dive uh, further down. So indeed, in that course, we made that same kind of choices. We dive down to a certain level, but then below that, we say, okay, if you want to go deeper, like um, deeper in the kernel, uh, then it's another entire course by itself, or if you want to dive deeper in Yocto, it's another another course by itself, and, and so on. And so on. I'm making a big pause because I want to see if anybody has anything to ask more about the course, because I, I, um, I, I want to chat with you about some um, some work you did with us in the bootloader, right? And, and yeah. I think we haven't had a chance to talk about that yeah. much in, in public yet. But I'll, I'll say something about the courses. So I always really appreciated that they were available online for free, um, and I I'd read all the slides from many of the courses in the past, but then um, a couple of years ago, I took many of the courses, and I, I got a lot of value out of actually the courses. Um, you know, definitely the the, the material in the slides is great, but um, there was definitely a lot of things like Thomas mentioned, like he'll drop the command line or to his editor and, and code things live or do things live, and and that was really helpful. Or also just sort of like ask like, oh, how did you do that? And pick up sort of tricks that people do to optimize their workflow and those sorts of things was really helpful. So. Um, yeah, because I've been wondering, like, oh, you know, I've already got the material. Should I pay the money for the course? And I did get a lot of value out of that. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And yeah, indeed, you've been one of our serial participants. I think you yeah. attended not all of the courses, but almost all of them. I think uh, you're one of the few people in the world who have attended almost all our courses. There's <laughs> a few other people who, who actually have the same policy. Whenever we um, we publish a new course, they, they register for the first session that's that's available uh, but you're one of the few who have done that yeah it was Thanks. great i'm excited about the audio you have just added as well that looks quite yeah, interesting that's a brand new one yeah uh, it's it's an example of one of those things where okay um you need to dive 
further down into that specific topic okay let's have let's have a course on it we have some knowledge some people who have knowledge expertise on that so let's make a course out of, of that that expertise and make it available it's it's of course the kind of course like our graphics one or real-time one they're a lot less popular than the embedded linux course right but they, yeah. they address a, a niche um, that not many other people address uh, because it requires expertise and some investment to develop the materials but we think it's, it's valuable because most people who need um, kind of um, some a way of accelerating their understanding of the audio stack or the real time stuff or the graphic stack. It, it's it's quite useful to have some either some free materials or or of course that they yeah. I'm not, I'm not familiar with this audio. Is it is that like focused around also and plugins mostly or is it? Uh... So the the audio course um, goes through um, mainly first the hardware kind of so we understand. Uh, audio codec, audio digital interfaces, what are the sound formats that are exchanged between codec and the audio interface and that kind of stuff. And then it goes to the kernel, mainly covering the embedded cases. So with the Alsace SOC, uh, ASOC subsystem. So how you create a device tree to describe that. Uh, I have this audio codec, I have this uh, digital interface, how they are connected with each other, uh, who is providing the clock and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we look into drivers for digital interfaces and, and codecs, and then we venture into user space, discuss the Alza Leap, the API for uh, doing Alza applications, but also all the configuration for Alza and user space, which is yeah, quite quite tricky. And then we go even further up uh, with Pipewire and GStreamer. So we kind of try to cover the entire stack from, from hardware, kernel, low-level user space, if you want, and let, let's say a high-level user space. Okay. Yeah. Have, have you ever looked at the Bella project? Um, the, the, it's a fun one for Beagle, um, but it doesn't use the traditional Linux audio stack, right? They kind of end run the whole audio, the traditional Linux audio stack. So which project, you say? Bella, B-E-L-A um, dot I-O, Bella dot I-O. Nope. Um, no, that doesn't bring any, no, that doesn't bring any Beagle, Beagle, Beagle Bomb yeah. Black and Pocket Beagle, but they use the, the peer used for doing the um, um, the, the sample delivery over I2S to, um, instead of like okay. using just a DMA. Um, All right. And that's so that they can really reduce the size of the, um, of the sample buffer, right? Because it's all about low latency audio. They have like a a half millisecond in and a half a millisecond out um, for a total one millisecond end to end with 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 processing, right? So um, yeah, I have a look. I have a look and mainly point my audio people to to that because I'm yeah. not the audio expert in in the house. Yeah, yeah. and they, they they focus around um, uh, this this tool called uh, Pure Data. I mean, there's there's other synthesis uh, tools that they integrate in with, right, that they work with, including just kind of native C, um, C++, um, kind of kind of processing like a little bit, but it's not exactly, it, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable C API um, you know, for coding up synthesizers, um, but they, you know, they have a high level interface with pure data um, so that they can, they can, you can you can run the full pure data stack through on the Linux side of things, um, and then essentially kind of push down the synthesizer into the um, their you know, real time runtime. Right, so mm -hmm. they can they can do the the pure data synthesis in a, that ultra low latency. Right, so half a millisecond from like electronic event right um, detected to synthesis output. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's indeed the kind of audio stack for super dedicated use use cases. Yeah, this is all about generating um, musical instruments, right? Yeah. So custom musical instruments, right? You know, I think it, you know you look at uh, Beagle use cases, right? They're also um, you know, Beagle is also heavily used in like broadcast audio, right? Which would be more um, your, your traditional also stack, but highly integrated with um, low latency networking, mm -hmm. right? And so people leverage the the, the Beagles. Um, real-time Ethernet interfaces, right, for doing like like um, multi-channel broadcasts in like uh, TV studios, um, things like that. So there's people building um, some some custom solutions around that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I love. So I'm, I, 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 for a long time, I was um, heavily involved in TI's audio business. I, so I, I have a, a, a particular love for audio. So I didn't even know, know you had an audio <laughs> training. Now I'm super. So I might take that one. All right. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the um, the work that we did together on the, the 
we call the Cape compatibility layer, but it ultimately ended up into the U-Boot. Um, ex- is it expansion or extension? What's the what's the command? I think it's expansion, we called it. Yeah, so you have like expansion scan. Um, yep. Of course, that's just that's just kind of one little element of it, right? The ability to go and, and scan for add-on boards. And I, I love the approach that you took, right? Because it wasn't just to make it work on, you know, Beagle Bones, right? You, you, you made sure it worked on, you know, Beagle Bone Black, um, Beagle Bone AI, um, but also um, it was the, um, I went the, the, the chip, right? The, yep. the, 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 I'm fairly sure it's defunct. I don't know, but, but it, you know, it, it is, yeah, unfortunately. It is, it is, yeah. Uh, it is. The, the chips and dips and, and, but just like you just took a really generic approach, one that we can all kind of, you know, build on in the community, right? So that, um, um, you know, kind of, kind of lifts all effort, right? Um, and of course, somebody could easily implement on something like a Raspberry Pi with hats. Um, if they chose to go down that path, right? I think that, um, you know, they copied a lot of the stuff that we're doing in terms of um, EEPROM descriptors um, in the expansions, right? But I, I, I feel like, People haven't really discovered um, not just the the, the, the U boot scan mechanism, which we're still not even using in our in our um, in our primary boot right now, right? I think we still have kind of our own homegrown solution. Robert, I'm looking at Robert's eyes moving. <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually a few users in mainline U boot for the extension expansion, and the, one of the problems I'm looking at is how do we switch that without breaking everything we've done for years and that's one of the issues at the same time i really need to move it onto distro boot so that's kind of a when i make the jump it's going to be a big jump yeah, yeah. so distro boot is going to be a useful jump too right it's a very good thing it's it's not very complicated but it's it's also very nice for users to stop having those weird like custom you would comments so yeah the maybe just to kind of give a bit of background on on this this, this project um Many years ago, we worked on chip, and as part of that, we uh, implemented at Bootlin and upstream in Ubuntu the support for device-free overlays, right? Because we have expansion boards. Um, the can, I don't know if it's the only way, but like probably the, the most correct way to, to support them was to describe each of the add-on boards with, with uh, device-free overlays and get them applied at the U-boot stage. Um, one of the reasons for, well, there are mainly two reasons for doing it at the U-boot stage. As, as of today, in the upstream Linux kernel, there still isn't any user space interface to apply overlays. Um, I think in the biggest board kernel, you have like a patch that you apply on the kernel that, that exposes that to user space, but in the mainline kernel, it, it still hasn't been accepted. That's one thing. And the other thing is that even if it's accepted, there are also subsystems that don't really like things to be added at runtime. And I remember back then, I, and on this one, I don't know if it has changed. I think it has not. But back then, the DRM subsystem was really unhappy with having panels uh, appearing at, at runtimes, right? So it was, it was too late to um, add the overlay once Linux had already put it, because it, it would be too late for the DRM subsystem to build that display pipeline. And, and so applying the overlay in U-Boot was seen f- from our perspective as the, let's say, the, the, the simplest path um, to, to get that sort of expansion board uh, supported. So that's that's when we laid kind of the ground, groundwork for having device-free overlay supported in you. And then fast forward a number of years uh, later, we had this conversation with you, where uh, for bigger um, uh, platforms, you had this kind of relatively messy set of U-Boot scripts talking with uh, EPROMs to figure out which expansion board was was there, and then apply the device-free overlay that, that, that matches uh, relying on, on previous work that we had done that I just mentioned. And so the idea was to, okay, can we make something generic out of that? And the generic part, and I, I like the fact that you mentioned we worked on, on bigger platforms and several of them, but also on chip. The whole idea in doing that is to uh, convince upstream that it is not a platform-specific need, right? This is So at Woodlin, I said we do trainings, but we also do engineering. And as part of this engineering, we do a lot of upstreaming. So we, I, I, I'm not going to say we know perfectly how to do upstream because I don't think anyone knows perfectly how to do upstream, but we've done a fair amount of it. And um, developing this expansion board mechanism is by itself, technically speaking, relatively easy, if not very easy. Uh, but building the case for it to get it accepted upstream is a bit more difficult. And one of the um, trick, but it's not only a trick, right? It's it's a reality when you want to get something accepted upstream. It's show that it's not only um, needed for yourself; it's needed for like 
a larger set of users, um, platforms for more people than just you, right? If you can show that, then you have a much higher chance to get your uh, new feature accepted. So that's why uh, back then we had proposed, we will do it for you, for Beagle, but we will also demonstrate that it works on at least one other platform to show, yes, it actually works for at least two different platforms. So if it works for two, there is a reasonable chance to think that it will also work for three, four, or more plans. So that that's how we, we what was our reasoning on, on that. And it I think it worked because uh, when we went through that upstream process, of course, we had questions about the implementation and details and things like that. But there were not really so much questions about the why, because it was already obvious that, okay, we've got at least two platforms that have done that. And they need something like this, so it, it makes sense, right? There is there is a solid reason for wanting that in, in your route. So that, that's why we went that route, and I think it, it worked reasonably well. So I'm looking forward to see that adopted for real in the uh, in the bigger bone, like official builds, because for now, the people using upstream u boots can, can enable that and make use of it. But indeed, in the official builds, it, it's not yet uh, leveraged. But I can I can definitely understand the um, the migration issue right because that's not something that we have really considered in the upstreaming in the solution that was upstream and even if we add i don't think it would have been easy to say hey we're doing it in that strange way because it's going to make it easier for us to have a migration pass from this let's say out of three custom solution to the upstream one this is an argument that it's that's a bit hard to bring uh, forward uh, to the upstream community so i guess yeah whatever Migration paths, how even painful, um, will have to be the migration paths that you take, Robert, I'm afraid. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is we are using the infrastructure you guys pushed and built, so the extension function is there. It's just that we're still doing a wrapper on, well, these are loaded, load these in this order. So it's all the infrastructure you built is still behind the scenes. It's okay. just that we're not doing the extension scan and this extension load. So okay. So all right. like everything's there, just that we still have my wrapper on top for historical reasons. Okay. And so, yeah. I'm actually curious if um, if any other SPC makers gone through and actually implemented this. I don't think I've seen it. It might have been productized, but I don't think I've seen it as like an advertised feature. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you look for the boot standard actually has it. There's a, yeah, the boot standard function calls the U-Booter use it now. There's a couple of SPC makers that are using an extension by default now. And I know we've been, uh, Nishan has been talking with TI about, hey, to quit, you know, use this, redefining it. Yeah, yeah no, I think it's in the same conversations with that. I finally got to use distro boot. It's like, use X to Linux, use, yeah, these are all in U boot. Don't reinvent it. Yep. There's some, there's another part to this. So a lot of the, the, um, the TI starter kit boards actually use pie headers. Um, and if you just define some base symbols in the main device tree, um, your overlays, right? Because just because you load an overlay on a, on a board doesn't mean it's going to work if the kernel that it's loading against doesn't match that overlay, right? So there, there, there's kind of a, a tight relationship to the base device tree and the overlay, obviously. But there's there hasn't been too much focus on what symbols get exposed for add-on boards, right? For, for, for any type of extension board that you might put on there in a way that, it, that makes that that header or something that's specified in the device tree in a way that overlays can functionally use that header. And the thing is, you can, right? That there's still some particular drivers that give you some trouble at getting the right granularity or symbols that you want to lay out in the device tree, but you can define enough about the pins in a, in a way that you can make symbol references in the overlay that can enable those pins that are completely independent of SOC or G, what GPIO they're at, right? We have the abstractions in the kernel to make these things work. Um, but not no, nobody, like, I, I really thought that once people saw this, that at least the Raspberry Pi folks would recognize the potential and and start making uh, you know common hat overlay symbols right but, but maybe then again they maybe they don't want to because then somebody like ti can come along and say oh you know for the sk i can use those same overlays so maybe ti might do that. i think yeah. for the, the pi people it's like u boot is not their main target so it's all it's only the community that touched but on the other end the the issue that uh, jason is talking about is not really u boot specific it's more like um, the overlay that, that you apply to the kernel device tree, whether it is applied by U-Boot and or by the Raspberry Pi specific firmware, 
doesn't really matter, right? Um, uh, but indeed, yeah, I, I know you've been working on, 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 on this kind of connector interface. I'm not sure exactly how it was called, but kind of creating an, an interaction between the expansion boards and the actual, um, the actual board uh, so that the connector exposes AI of two SPI buses, two i 2 c three UARGs, and I don't know, 12 GPIOs. And, and the mapping between those to the, and the, 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 the interfaces of the SOC is, is uh, not visible directly to the overlay describing the expansion board. So that, that's definitely a neat idea. I think it needs more effort to be pushed upstream. Um, the, yeah. And I, I don't want to blame the Raspberry Pi community, but I will do it nevertheless. Uh, they've not been the best in, in, in working with upstream. It has been, it has improved a lot uh, in recent years, especially on the graphics side. But historically, it's been kind of uh, its own kind of closed community, uh, inventing its own technologies. They, they don't use U-Boot, for example. Um, one of the reasons why we don't use Raspberry Pi in our course, right? I will, just just a couple of days ago on LinkedIn, we had a comment from someone, hey, do you have Raspberry Pi support on your course? And I said, no, we don't, because if you learn Raspberry Pi, you don't really learn Embedded Linux, because they do a lot of things in a strange way, which is only this way on Raspberry Pi and on no other ARM or ARM64 platform. So that's why we stick to like BeagleBone or BeaglePlay or other ARM platforms that use like a standard boot chain and, and like more standardized technologies, which I think is is the right way to do things because that's why Linux is great, right? It's the same Linux, the same bootloader. When you change from platform A and B, like you move to from BeagleBone to Beagle Play, it's still your boot, it's still the same commands, it's still the same environment. A few things are different because of course it's not the same platform, but you can feel the operating system is the same, the bootloader is the same. Um, so, and I said, yeah, Raspberry Pi was not the, the best platform we think because it's so kind of, not, not unique, but kind of stands a bit on the side, and and they've been um, also yeah a bit uh, aside from the from the upstreaming process and upstream community. It, again, it has improved, but on this boot flow, not so much. Uh, it's still very custom. Very they have this their own overlay um, uh, Git repository that's very specific to Raspberry Pi. So they definitely lack some momentum to build um, something more common uh, that would indeed allow. Um, producers of expansion boards that match the, I know, the microboot standard or the Pi header standard, if you can call it a standard, uh, the Arduino header standard, we could collect all of those overlays into a common place and, and have this connector interface uh, nicely be exposed by the device trees of the different platforms that expose a Pi header, that expose a microboot header, that expose uh, an Arduino header, but we're not there yet, um, just need someone to... Yeah. Do well, I think part I, of the problem too was in the Linux kernel. We for a long time we were always thinking like the device trees would leave the kernel at some point, and we finally just you know two months ago in ARM thirty two. Well, let's separate all the uh, ARM into actually sub vendors. So now I think everyone's okay. Device trees are going to live in Linux forever now. So maybe the overlays could finally be pushed in. Because I think we yeah. all thought that they'd be external at some point. So why push it mainline? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe they're just part. I, 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 I've been in the device tree thing since it got introduced in, in the ARM world. And so I've kind of followed, at least not, not in the recent years, so that close, but in the, in the initial years, very closely. And it definitely the idea, I think, at the time was to, at some point, have the device trees outside of the Linux kernel. But realistically speaking, it never happened. And, and the more we move, the less likely it's going to happen, I suppose. So maybe there needs to be a stronger push to bring those overlays into mainline and kind of accept the kernel is the de facto reference location for getting device tree files, including overlays. Maybe that's... We, we, we keep talking mainline, right? And I think that brings up a really key philosophy difference between the board and Raspberry Pi, right? Because our goal is right, ultimately to enable other people to make things and not try to take it over, right? We want to really enable the upstream projects Right. Most of your course doesn't actually, I mean, there's a few places where you clone um, some of our, our trees to get some, some particular patches, but for the most part, you're just using upstream projects and, and not necessarily anything that, that like we're 
shipping, right? As a, you know, as the, the enable, the core enablement on, the on flashed onto the board, right? You go and reinvent it from, from upstream, right? Which is, which is, which is our goal. Cause we really want to respect the developer community and ultimately professional developers that want to go and actually make real, real products, right? Out of, out of, out of what we've created, if they go and make their own board or they buy our board and use it in a, in a system, either way, you know, we want them to be fully empowered, not kind of stuck um, living within, you know, a smaller pond, right? Or, or however you might describe it. And the only reason that, you know, the, the Beagle version exists at all is just because it hasn't been up, um, accepted into the mainline kernel yet, right? It's not, uh, yeah. it's not you not wanting it to be there, right? It's just, it's maybe not, not baked enough or hasn't been reviewed enough that it's checked, but the goal is to eventually get it upstream. Yeah. yeah. And the, the the nice parts are the TI parts, where TI is actively taking things and pushing it into the the, the the mainline kernel. Sometimes we get a few things that that you know Robert and I might hack on, um, you know, that just might live longer than they should. Right? Ultimately, they they need they just need to land upstream too. Yeah, I think, and in our course at least, and and we also obviously applied that idea and philosophy to the engineering projects that we do we believe upstream is the right the right way to go uh, when i see the number of customers contacting us for um crazy backports because they're stuck in a 4.9 candle yeah. but they need to enable a new wi-fi chip and they're like eh, i can't upgrade because i'm using and i'm gonna, not gonna give any names platform foo from vendor bar that is only providing a 4.9 candle and then has, has given up on any support um, they're really screwed, right? They're really, really screwed, yeah. and, and their their choices are either they backport a Wi-Fi driver with all the effort wasted doing that and the complexity involved, or they need to port a newer kernel to their hardware, which for a number of SOCs is is not trivial. Uh, it can be done for sure. We we know how to do that, uh, but sometimes with SOCs. Uh, don't have any documentation available uh, or it's under very restrictive NDAs. Um, so yeah, going upstream is definitely like potentially saving the life of a number of projects, products, and usually not initially because people don't realize when they start building their product, they get the, the SDK from their silicon vendor like, hey, it works, I can ship a product with that. It's only five years or 10 years later that those products are still in the field and their 4.9 candle is no longer updated and they have no uh, cyber security requirements that require them to have uh, a candle that's uh, maintained or they have the need to update I know, a part uh, of their, their device like a, I know, a 3G, 4G modem uh, because they can't source it anymore or a Wi-Fi chip because they can source it anymore or a FI, uh, Ethernet FI with the, the sourcing uh, issues. Recently, a lot of companies had to switch their Ethernet file from vendor A to B, and uh, the file driver for file B is not in this super old kernel. It's all in mainline. If they had been using mainline, it would have been just like, hey, build a new kernel, it's there, it's, it work out, works out of the box, but they're yep. stuck in the past. So yeah, using upstream in all our courses is really important for us because it also conveys to our participants, hey, look, we're not using the vendor SDK, we're using upstream, and we explain in the slides why we do that multiple times, we, we, uh, we explain the value of that. So um, yeah, we definitely believe it, it's the right way to go. And it, yeah. Within TI, one of the phrases that you'll hear a lot is, um, you'll, you'll hear developers you know, refer to this as giving a, giving a product to the community. And it's not meant in the sense of, oh, we're offloading all development work to you guys, don't worry about it, we're gonna give up and, you know, move on to the next thing it's more enabling the community to that you know once once we have moved on to new soc and it kind of becomes more of a I mean, maintenance work type thing the community itself is enabled to actually add new features fix bugs things like that and you know there's still obviously support from from ti after that yeah and I, and i can say from the other side because i'm not on the silicon vendor side but it works i mean we see products like the am235x from ti which is excellent support in in upstream we can just build a new upstream kernel, use it for a product, and it, and it just works, right? And if there are issues, there are so many companies and users of this SOC in the kernel community, in the U-Boot community, that we will find someone who is maintaining that particular driver or has worked out that particular issue. Um, so it, it works. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of, you might think, but who is going to fund that work? Who is going to organize that work? It, it's, in theory, it should not work. In practice, it does. 
right? <laughs> so that's kind of maybe one of the mind-blowing things about the open source community is that in theory, I mean, this big mess of random people connected over the internet doing something together, it should not work. But it's so cool that it does, though. It's just wonderful, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> but it, it's exactly. The reality shows that it actually does work, even though on paper it should not. It's impossible that it works. I mean, if you draw that on paper, there's no way it can work. But it does. The M3 has just been so so wonderful for us, and you know, with the, with all the upstream support, right? So every year we sell more Beagleblocks. Blacks every like it continues. Like so now it's over ten years old now. Or ten Beagleblock Black I think is ten years old this year, um, and I think we're up over six million. Uh, I think it, well, I know it's over six million. I don't think the seven million yet, but it's like uh, in the middles of, of six million uh, Beagleblock Blacks sold at this point. Um, yeah, and it you know, continues to grow here. Even though the design is completely open source and anybody can actually just go to distribution and buy all the parts that it's on the board, build it themselves. Yeah, and it's, it's still very well alive. Just uh, remember last year we did a project for a customer who has a, a product in the healthcare industry based on the Big Old Bone Black. So they use the off the shelf Big Old Bone Black, who is, of course, their custom cape on top of it for all their product specific uh, devices and and they add uh, I think a 4.9 Debian based system and they wanted to of course refresh their old BSP and have something so they've chosen build root because they were more familiar with, with that to have a better control of what goes into the image and we're able to build like a full upstream based um, thing with top notch handle top notch build root uh, and deliver that to, to our customer with yeah very little issues uh, we could also, um, they were using the PRU, so we were able to kind of update a little bit the way they were using the PRU as part of that. So it's it's still, even though it's a 10 years old product, it's still very well alive, including for engineering projects, uh, doing yeah, BSP refreshes from time to time, keeping things up to date and putting things where we can. You've yeah. probably seen it, but there's a mystery. There's a mystery medical board that's that's popping around the Discord right now. They're trying to figure out what it is. They took apart some some German medical device and it's got a beagle with a, a surprise cape. <laughs> yeah, a little heart cape in there. Yeah. I'm not gonna give names of course. Yeah. They're not no. <laughs> it's part of the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there are some medical products based on the bomb. Oh, not, not too critical ones, of course, but there are some. Now, you mentioned PRU, and I think that's like for a lot of uh, people in your industry, it's like helping support the community. And like it's still 10 years later, there's still basically two directions people go with the PRU. You can either use the TI one, which is now actually finally with mainline uh, last release, or you can use the community based UIO. So, for a lot of customers, whether what kernel they have, there's two directions they can go for the PRUs, and that you know, when they want to jump kernels, that does take support. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, as part of that, and then we move to UIO and a more like upstream standards approach for for that. Yeah, the only problem is now both mainline, both are mainline options. Yeah. So yeah, we're still gonna have a lot of customers, you know, stuck on one or the other. Like, okay, go to mainline. Now, which one do I want? So yeah. I just yeah. had a good chuckle because remote proc is now mainline for the PRU on the AM3. So it only you know, took a while, but. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 reasons to use both ap approaches, but I still like using the the loader, the remote proc loader, whether or not you use RP message or not, right? So, right, you can with just an overlay change, right? You can kind of switch fairly easily between UIO for remap of the data, the, the data memory of the processor itself. Um, the program memory, I think, just works out a lot better. Just load it with um, the remote proc, proc and have the start stop and all that stuff managed by the by the kernel um, and not relying on a user space library that is because to use UIO, you don't really need any user space library, right? It's only the stuff that starts and stops the PRU um, that would kind of drive you to using that um, lib PRU or whatever it was called. Um, the, the the classic where the whole the whole PRU cores were mapped by uh, UIO, including the controller, the control region, and the and 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 there is. You know, I, I, there, there's some reluctance, right? Because people like that full control from 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 user space, and they could really have like really lockstep control over the um, pure you. They people even done debuggers that way, um, right? There's there's a there's a lot of useful infrastructure, um, but from a uh, uh, you know, it doesn't. There's no upstream, right? That, I mean, there is an upstream, but there's not, right? There's like who maintains that? Who owns all that that that, that stuff, right? And and I'd rather just have that owned by the, the kernel developer here, right? Get something into a shape. Um, if you want debugging features, if you want loading features, if you want things, just put those into the remote proc driver and that infrastructure um, to 
to to have it managed and in place. Um, you know, yeah. So and and still, if you want to do really fast ring buffers with UIO, just go for it. Right? There's there's nothing that stops you from the that slows down the the the, the real time performance side of things. But you know, as much of the just management side stuff that can go in the kernel, I just think it's a, a better approach to put my 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 two cents in. Yeah, true. Um, I just can't wait to see it, what people do with the play and the, and the UI. You know, some people are heck of UIO in the play, so it's like move your old PRU programs to the play and see what it can do. And yeah, it's, it's the uh, PRUs are very similar between the M3 and the M625. So one of the things we did funny on the the, the plays, the you know, because the expansion is all standard, um, right? And it's, you know, standard connectors, Microbus Grove, Quick, um, right? And there's of course there's a a Raspberry Pi camera connector, uh, the OLDI is kind of its own thing, but right, uh, you know, it's just standard expansion, you know, um, but that microbus driver, right, um, you know, people are wanting to go and, and do bit bang, but we have like a like a manifest for like over 100 clicks that people could just load with that driver. We've, we've posted the um, the RFC, Vaishnav um, Akaf um, posted the, the RFC for that microbus driver but in ti went and hired him away from us and so we've got you know it hasn't yet kind of been massaged and conditioned to really land um upstream right it hasn't i'd really love some attention on that rfc and, and people looking at that on other platforms because there's nothing you know beagle specific right there's tons of linux boards out there with microbus headers and now with the um the click id and the and the manifests right we kind of end run that whole um, you know, device tree overlay stuff, right? So, um, you know, the proposal is to make it an actual box. Um, and we can do that because the, the pin connections are so normalized, right? And it's so limited, right? So it's kind of, you know, we still have to go back and do the CAPE compatibility layer. If, like if we want to do like an a, a pocket Beagle based on AM62 or Beagle on Black based on AM62, um, then we still have to go back and, you know, deal with the Cape compatibility layer. But right now with Beagle Play, right, that's a lot simpler because Microbus is a bus in the kernel. And the nice thing is too, there's over there's like 300, 400 boards that are Linux capable that have that Microbus header on it. So it's, you know, where the Raspberry Pi people are, you know, here's our overlay, here's our header, and then they kept it in the house. This could be something that all the boards could have the same overlays potentially with, or manifest yeah. with, so that you could have whether it's a microchip board, an ST board, or a TI board, oh, just plug in your click and the driver loaded. And and way back when, we actually tried to make a proposal for including overlays in the EEPROMs, right? That was, but, but there was no standardization, right, around, like, what symbols were exposed. Like, you know, it was totally kernel specific. So there's no way you could actually put an overlay in the EEPROM and kind of hope that it would would work right with the manifests right we've kept all the platform specific stuff out of it it's only bus specific information there in the manifest and so um, microelectronic is actually putting um, manifests into the eprom on the um, quick boards right and we've also got one manufacturer making you know 1500 of these so we can go kind of one point right and hopefully i mean it's it's an open standard too right microbus they publish the standard they let you use the, the logo for free if you follow the standard for microbus all right so it's it's an open ecosystem that other people engaged in and you know right now we're trying to make sure that all the documentation is right for the for the for the the, the click id and the manifest so that other people kind of replicate that stuff um there's there's like for a huge majority of like the sensors and actuators and little things that you want to connect on to the Linux systems out there today, right? You get SPI, S C, UART, uh, A to D, um, some basic GPIO with interrupts, um, 3.3 volt power and, and 5 volt power, although we're restricted to only 3 volt IO, um, even though we do provide 5 volt power, right? There's, there's not a lot of embedded sensory stuff that you can't connect up over that. Um, um, yeah, so um, I think there's a lot of upstream potential, uh, you know, in the community, right, to to um, to make the microbus um, experience really completely seamless, right? So if you haven't checked that out, Thomas, is this all new to you, or is this so? But based on our, on our experience, upstream this kind of things is not. It, it's a bit like the expansion stuff we did in Ubuntu, right? It's not complicated, technically speaking, but yeah. Community-wise, it requires a bit of so it requires a bit of persistence, 
right, on in pushing things, but it needs to be smart persistence, right? If you just like push hard, it, it's probably not going to work. You need to build the case around the topic, uh, talk about it at conferences. So it may take it may take a while before this gets uh, accepted upstream. And at at Bootman, we've upstream stuff that has taken sometimes a year or two to get accepted. Um, just because we need to give the time for the community to grasp the challenges, the opportunities of that particular feature, understand what it is, what it means, what problem it is solving. So it, it takes a while uh, to do. Um, so definitely that microbus um, stuff looks super interesting, but I guess it needs to be pushed further. And and if if you just work on it two or three months and then give up, it's, it's not going to work, right? It needs yeah. some more... And maybe not long term, but at least mid term, like push uh, to uh, have a chance to be. Uh, active. It's definitely something to follow up on. Um, just trying to be mindful of, uh, of Thomas's time here. I guess uh, one one last thing I wanted to mention is, um, if you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you guys also happen to publish a lot of your courses in French. You're based out of France. I think that's that's kind of cool. So we're based in France, but we also have an engineer in Italy who doesn't speak French, so we're uh, not, not on, no longer French only. And all our materials are in English. We teach the course in English, uh, so we teach it with that French uh, accent that you can hear for an hour. Um, but but we teach the course in, in mostly in English. We do from time to time teach some courses in in France, and in this case, we teach them in French. But especially in those days of post-COVID era, uh, many of them are online for uh, intentional teams. So I think 98% of the courses we teach are, are in English and all the materials are in English. I was just going to mention because you guys are going to be at Embedded Recipes, right? Uh, coming up soon uh, here. Absolutely, yeah. Next next month, uh, Paris. And uh, I think it's September 28, 29, if I'm correct. Yep. Uh, yeah, organized by, by uh, Pay Libre this year, I think for the first year. Uh, two two days of, of conference, very good uh, very good events. I've been to um, Kennel Recipes some years ago, and Embedded Recipes is modeled exactly after that. It's it's quite a unique uh, event, I, I, I believe, compared to other conferences. Uh, it's a single track event, so you don't get to choose what you get to see. It's one thing, which you can see as being a drawback, like oh, but what what if it's not interesting? And so the way they solve that is by ensuring that everything is interesting, and that's that's kind of true, is because the set of talks and speaker is heavily curated and and selected by the by the organizers, and and therefore the overall content is very very good. And I've been myself surprised at attending talks at Kenya recipes that I wouldn't have attended, but actually found it interesting nevertheless. Right, because it kind of okay. It's not necessarily my initial like focus or expertise, but it, it turned out to be like um, mind opening or in, and interesting, and and so really really great. And the other aspect that makes the conference unique, at least to my eyes, is the size of the crowd. Uh, it's 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 a small crowd. It's more like 100, 150, 200 maybe people, which is like several times smaller than your usual Embedded Linux conference, which really facilitates like interaction, networking. It's it's more like a family gathering um, than this, you know, this huge commercial corporate uh, corporate events, which means that the value of the conference is not just in the talks that you go to, but also in, in all those additional interactions that you get with the with the people there. So I definitely recommend the, the people listening to us uh, to um, book their uh, their tickets to embed recipes and or kind of recipes it, they're in, in the same week right Monday Tuesday Wednesday is kind of recipes and then Thursday Friday is embedded recipes and it's right in the center of Paris so if you're from the US I guess that would make a, a very nice a very nice trip to, to France all packed in one week, five days of conference with very good content. So much, much recommended. Yeah, and we still have tickets available for Embedded Recipes. So people yeah. can go to embedded-recipes.org uh, and check that out. Um, and yeah, like Thomas was saying, it's the nice thing is it's, it's a really intimate conference. It's going to be probably uh, about 100 people. Um, and like, for example, like the food's included. So like lunches on site, snacks are on site. And there's also... Um, evening events as well so like last last time i like you know i happened to sit down at lunch and like Greg cage was at the same table so you might sit down and talk to people who you might not otherwise want to talk to you might be intimidated to talk to but it's no big deal because it's a small event and everyone's friendly and, and wants to hang out so 
it's quite quite a nice experience. Yeah, fully agree with that. And we'll definitely be there at Woodland. So we'll be um, we are sponsoring the event, helping uh, uh, Belib with along with many other sponsors to make it possible. Um, and we'll have one engineers uh, of our team giving a lightning talk on Snackboot, a project that we released recently, uh, I think in May this year. Um, an open source tool to facilitate recovering and refreshing embedded boards. So we'll have a short short talk at the conference, among many other super interesting talks that are, that are in in the lineup. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited. The snack boot uh, tool looks quite interesting, so I think that'll be. Uh, I'm looking forward to that talk. Definitely looking forward to it, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was very nice. Absolutely great. Definitely catch up with you later again on a, on a future episode. And uh, again, keep up, keep up the awesome work. We love to see it. You know, I'm and sure a lot of people <laughs> keep up the good work on Beagle because I mean it's really important for us. Uh, the fact that the Beagle platforms are been so stable for so long, it's a very good foundation for us to build training courses on. As much as I believe it is solid foundation for uh, companies to build products on. And the fact that, uh, Jason, you mentioned the big bone has been around for 10 years. I mean, for us, it's very important because it means we don't have to change boards every single day. Uh, unlike some other vendors that keep changing stuff all the time. Uh, here, you've got a stable pass for a very long period of time. And we're kind of expecting the same with the, with the big play, which is another reason why we, we selected that, that platform. So I think that's longevity. Uh, just like using upstream allows you to have like longevity in the maintenance, uh, using, uh, Beacon board platform can also provides that, which for us is, is important. So thanks for having all these development boards available to the, 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 the wider community. I think it's a very useful tool for people to learn uh, technology, Thank learn you. Linux, learn programming, learn embedded. So thanks for yes. that. Thank you.